Good evening, folks. Um, welcome to the fourth and final uh, Disciple Makers Field Guide session. And um, just to remind you what we've been looking at. Um, so we, we looked at why we actually need to make disciples, what disciple making looks like in this day and age, where, when, and with whom we make disciples. And tonight we're going to be looking at how we make disciples, which in a very simple way is basically the Jesus way. He, he gives us the method, the mode. Um, he is the one who we look to as our model. Um, but we live in very different times to him. Um, he made disciples at a time where um, it was natural for a rabbi uh, or teacher to gather around him a group of uh, teachable people. Um, like we would normally think of a, a class. Wesley uh, took that idea of a class and he, he, he generated groups in a way that made sense for his time. Um, so we're trying to work that out for this day and age. So as I shared from session three last time, um, we obviously have to basically start the process by sh sharing and scattering the seed, the word of the gospel, um, on all terrain. Um, we need to pray that the hard terrain becomes soft um, and we need to, um, where necessary, pick out the stones from stony ground and, and uh, try and kill the weeds in the thorny soil. But overwhelmingly, what we need to do is spend most of our time in the good soil. Uh, that's the one that's going to give us the greatest return. What is that return? That return is more disciples. So if we're making disciples, it's going to result in producing more disciples um, because they are going to become disciple makers too. So let's have a look in more depth about that process. So first thing to say is it involves a community. Um, this is not a, a solo project. We don't go a lot alone. We're not a one man band. Um, the, the simplest level of disciple making, Jesus sent the disciples out in twos. Um, Paul operated in twos at least when he traveled around, partly for safety. Um, but there's also another reason. If we take the fivefold, which is the uh, range of gifts to the church that's expressed in Ephesians chapter four uh, of prophet apostle, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Um, most of us are, would naturally have gifts uh, for at least a couple of those. So if we go in pairs, um, we're mo more than likely to be covering um, four um, of those bases. And obviously, they all have a different role and all are useful for disciple making. Um, this is a, an example of how they could be utilized. Um, it's not uh, you know, a perfect example. Um, within a community, um, discipleship can happen over time in a whole range of ways. But perhaps someone encounters um, a, prophet, a prophet, um, someone who gives them uh, a prophetic word or picture or maybe an encounter with uh, power ministry and healing or something like that. That's going to move someone in the direction of faith. Um, often it's an evangelist who shares the word of God with them and actually uh, brings them into faith and into some sort of early discipleship. And that's often when the pastor or teacher really gets going. An evangelist um, tends to uh, be someone who, who moves from person to person naturally, quite sociable. Uh, and often we'll pass it on. So if you look at me and my wife, um, I'm an evangelist, she's a pastor, she naturally will care for those in uh, a few in a much deeper way because she doesn't move from person to person. Um, so that pastor-teacher figure can really help instill a, an identity in Christ and that some of the basics of the faith. Um, apostles tend to be really good at mobilizing uh, disciples and challenging disciples. So 
when it comes to actually getting a new disciple to become involved in leadership um, or developing their, um, this, their ministry um, or even being sent out um, into another situation, um, that's where an, uh, an apostle might have their strength. So let's just look at, uh, this is a kind of a, a process of four stages. You've seen this before laid out as a strip. Um, but the point here is that a good disciple maker models all four parts of the process. So you cannot make a fully rounded disciple unless you are actually able to do all four things. Now, it stands to reason you've got to do the first thing. If you can't engage a, a seeker uh, to the point of telling them about Jesus, then you're never going to make a disciple. You know, if, you, if you don't sow the seed, the plant will not grow. Um, but if you just engage the seekers and, and bring them to a point of belief, um, that's only stage one of the process. There's so much more to do. So um, encouraging new believers is really, really important. Get, getting them into the Bible, uh, praying with them, um, help, helping them to get their identity in Christ. Once they're a disciple, um, we actually need to equip them with a greater level of skills. So it might be leadership skills, it might be uh, working on their character. Um, if you're doing that, then that naturally involves giving them responsibility. Now, to begin with, it's probably serving. Um, if you are given the opportunity to serve, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, that is gonna develop your character. So when I first arrived at St. Thomas, Philadelphia, and I went to, to Paul McConaughey, the, the leader at the time, you know, I was bristling with, uh, excitement about leading and uh, and uh, you know doing things up on the stage and he said i want you to do the displays on um the notice board it was a behind the scenes thing um to be honest it wasn't my greatest area of skill set um but it helped work on my character it taught me obedience it made me do the hard graph behind the scenes. And in later in the year, I was given the opportunity um, to preach. And that was obviously more of a challenge in terms of my skill set. Um, but I think he got it in the right order. He was working on my character first and then giving me the opportunity to um, excel in my ministry second. Finally, Making disciples involves empowering courageous disciple makers. So we have not made a full disciple until the point where we're encouraging and empowering them to go do the same. And of course, you have to wait till the end of the process before you do that. Um, they're seeing you model at all times, so you can help doing it at all times. And we often use the acronym MORE, which stands for model, you model it first to everybody, then you assist them in doing it themselves, then you watch, you stand back and let them do it themselves, but with, with you not too far away. And finally, L um, is you leave them on to their own, to do it on their own. So it's, you do it all to begin with, and then you step by step, stand back and give them more responsibility. Okay, um, we're going to pause there. And I'd love us just to talk, um, discuss um, what we thought about that. Um, have any questions um, before we move on? Okay, so we've worked out that we there are different stages and we need to be able to model all four. Um, let's have a look at what the, um, the soil look, should look like, really, for nurturing um, these new believers. So um, 
if we're going to be disciple makers, we, we you know, imagining our field, uh, we've sown the seed and we've got some sprouting. We've got, you know, some seeds that have responded. What needs to be in that soil to make them grow? Um, so using that analogy, um, actually, it doesn't have to be complicated. So let's just make it concrete for a second. So somebody's come to faith. It might be um, someone who you've been sharing regularly with at work or over a coffee, uh, someone in your, um, your sports club uh, or somebody at school, somebody, um, somebody who maybe has just wandered into church because they're interested. What does it take to grow that disciple? Now, there are all sorts of good resources out there. We might give them a book. Uh, we might think of sending them on an alpha course. Um, these are all programmatic, if you like. They're not bad things. In fact, they're good things. But they're all, as far as I'm concerned, um, part of the, um, the, the fabric of the soil. They're not actually the nutrients in themselves. And the best thing that you can do with a new disciple is to actually model things for them, to do it with them, um, partly starting with yourself and then inviting them. So this happens at church all the time. If we've got someone new, um, like a couple of weeks ago, for example, conversation after church, they told me of a need they had. And I said, well, shall we pray? And so I said, well, I'm going to pray. And then I'd like you to pray. Now, they might have felt a little bit nervous about that. But having heard me pray, they probably heard that it was just like me talking to my heavenly dad, just in simple conversation. There weren't any clever words. Uh, there wasn't any uh, special posture necessarily. And, and they felt like they could then pray. But right from the get-go, there was a, ch a little challenge there for them to follow suit. So prayer is a really good one. I think it's the first one I would always start with. Um, not long after that, the Bible. Um, now, the reason for the Bible is manyfold. One, you're introducing them to the, the story of God, um, the big history of uh, God's kingdom and um, you might be introducing them to characters um, that people can see themselves in or situations that they can see themselves in um, but obviously within the New Testament particularly um, there is the Gospels where you're pointing them towards Jesus and people always find that engaging and exciting to, to hear or to find out firsthand about this person of history that they've heard yeah, so much about. But secondly, the teachings of how to live the Christian life. Um, and you know, anyone who can read, or even people who can't read, who can listen to it on an audio, are able to, to get in there straight away. Obviously, they can do that on their own. They can do that with you. But at this point, I would say the best way to, to read scripture um, is in community. So um, an example of this is somebody from Food Bank wanted to discuss the Bible. So I suggested uh, I brought uh, a friend along and we sat on a, on a park bench and read scripture together. Now, the really important thing here is like we can very easily go into Christian mode of uh, teacher pupil. We know more than them, so we're going to tell them everything we know. They're passive and they just listen, and we are maybe feeling ill-equipped to answer all their questions. If you change the environment that you're bringing them into, you straight away change the dynamics. So do this with just three of you. You've got three different viewpoints of any particular Bible story that you discuss together. We call this Discovery Bible Study. We've been practicing it uh, every month at Cafe Church. And um, it's not the only way to study the Bible, but it's probably the best way for a new believer to study the Bible. 
because whilst they're coming to it from their point of view, they also will have questions and points of view that are new to you. So you will be learning in a new way and you will be understanding where they're from, coming from. And um, yes, you might be able to answer some of the questions, but from very early on, you're saying, what do you think? And you're training them to feed themselves. And you're also relying on the Holy Spirit to help um, bring understanding because it's, it's that Holy Spirit action that brought them to a point of faith in the first place. I would say when any group that you or community that you bring together, you need a healthy mix of what we call up in and out, uh, a relationship with God, a relationship with one another, and a relationship with um, our mission to the world. Um, or to put it another way, the three ships, worship uh, of God, uh, fellowship with one another, di discipleship or making disciples of all nations. So that's the threefold, um, if you like, a threefold mix of any good, um, any good group. Challenge to serve and lead. This is often missing from most forms of church because, and um, apart from being put on a coffee rotor or a welcome rotor, um, challenge to serve and lead is actually um, challenging from the get-go of a new believer to um, obey what, what they've learned from scripture, to train someone else, to teach somebody else what they've learned, um, and to share their faith with others. They can do it right from the get-go um, because they're just sharing what they know and they only have to have, you know, learn one thing to, to be one step ahead. And then finally, accountability. Um, a place where you can be honest, you can repent, you can um, ask for prayer, things you find difficult. So there may be others, um, but that's... That's my list, my fairly simple list. Another way to think about it is that disciples are living things. And just as in biology, we learn that a plant needs, uh, has uh, seven things that it always does. Um, and animals have seven things that they always do. Well, so do disciples. So, um, if we relate them to spiritual life, um, we need to move. Movement is key. Um, and for me, that's giving freedom to decide. We're not there to heavy shepherd. We're not there to um, restrict. Um, a disciple needs to be able to discern uh, and be free to make their own mistakes and also to hear the voice of God, to be called and to be sent. So there's movement. Reproducing, well, we've, we've said not only are we to make disciples, but we make disciples that make disciples. So that's reproduction right there in the center. Just in the same way, right at the core of me is DNA that reproduces, um, cells which reproduce, um, tissues that reproduce. Um, all of these things need to reproduce for another one of me to be produced. So reproduction is there right from the smallest part of disciple making to the to the end. Um, sensitivity, um, we need to be able to adapt to our context. That's what we're having these sessions for, so we can just wrestle it through together. Um, nutrition, um, I take to be the word of God, um, the bread of life that we need to feed on. Excretion is getting rid of all those things that hinder. hinder um, sin so effectively but it can also be things like distractions of, of wealth or uh, running after worldly things respiration we need to involve the spirit of God in everything that we do as disciple makers and growth is obviously something that will come out of that okay I'm going to pause there um, and I'll pause there and we're going to just um, see how that sits with us. Uh, maybe you've got other things that you'd like to add to this list. Um, and let's discuss it together.
Okay, welcome back. So, um, just going to have a look at um, multiplication versus addition. Um, so, if you're speaking in maths terms, obviously adding, um, you can add one and one, you get two. If you multiply one and one, you get one. So, you could say, well, addition wins. Um, if you're doing it and you keep doing it, two add two is four, multiply two times two, you get four. So again, they're equal, but what's you know what's the big deal? But over time, multiplication wins. So three plus three is six, three times three is nine. Um, if you keep multiplying, um, even though perhaps the work of multiplying disciples takes longer, um, you will get um, exponential growth. And that is what we saw amongst the early disciples. Um, there are two Greek words in Acts. Um, one is um, God added um, to their number daily. Um, the other one is Brethuno, um, which um, basically means multiplication. So it, there was exponential growth. Um, from sort of Acts 4, 5 onwards, which led to, within 300 years, the whole Roman Empire being about 10% Christian. So it was an absolute explosion of growth. Now, yes, the spirit was at work. Yes, Jesus had just been um, resurrected before their eyes. But um, there must have been something about the way they made disciples, quickly and simply. Um, to allow that to take place. Now, a simple bit of uh, diagrammatics for, for social um, modeling can help. So most of the way in which we make disciples in the West is addition growth. So somebody comes along to church or we invite someone along to church um, or our small group and they are added to the number and we think, well, that's great. They've come to know the Lord. Um, that person is usually extracted from the environment that they were in um, and made Christian, if you like. So they've come into a Christian environment. Multiplication says that we go out from our Christian subculture into another context, a non-Christian context. Now, that context often has community already there so we don't have to generate it we don't have to spend time money effort in generating community out of nothing there's already a neighborhood there's already a network there's already friends or family um, at work there's a there's a fringe of, of relationships around us and if we take the gospel to them and perhaps just find that one person of peace and they want to know more we stay with that person as Luke 10 tells us, we stay with the person of peace, teaching them what Jesus taught us. You, in our church, you have the power to baptise that person. They come to faith. It didn't take any magic. It didn't take me or any uh, other special person to do it. Um, you can baptise them. You can pray with them. You can um, teach them the Bible. And the hope is that they then share that with the people around them so that they become the best evangelist and ideally you'll be doing that with at least one other person uh, in support of you at the same time you are teaching them to go and do likewise and right from the get-go they are mobilized to multiplication uh, so that's these right right uh, hand arrows you know, they are also going into their places of work, their neighbourhoods, uh, and spreading uh, the gospel. So I call this mobilisation of multiplying disciples. So every disciple can potentially become a disciple maker. Every home or workplace or uh, living room can become a training base, a place of teaching. And every group um, is a potential sending uh, mission agency. Yeah, so we've got this sort of idea of yeast in the dough. 
Um, even though each of those bits of yeast is very, very small, it can fill the entire loaf. Now, things that multiply tend to have things uh, about them that help them multiply. So if you think about seeds, they're tiny, aren't they? Um, if you think about um, ideas that catch on within society or slogans, they're often very simple and they're memorable, they're sticky. Um, so I've got this sticky, stick, sticky uh, uh, post-it note there. Um, Jesus loves you is a very simple sticky phrase that I, I think most people will have heard. Well, why does it go around? Well, one, it's true. Number two, it's, it's easy to say, it's easy to grasp hold of. It's sticky. Um, so the same applies to our discipleship groups. We are not trying to create some great um, pyramid scheme or some great uh, intricate um, church structure because it's just not simple. It's not therefore reproducible. Um, the other thing about kingdom stuff is um, it's relational. It's person to person. Um, the minute we kind of rely on the internet or great advertising or poster campaigns or anything too clever, it becomes um, non-relational. Non it's not about, you know, you can't trust um, all advertising as glossy and, and as a million pound, uh, a billion pound exercise as it is because it is not conveyed by a person. So there's a breakdown in trust. Um, so relational, realistic. Um, if it's person to person, there's only so many people, contacts that you can have. So I manage, you know, 72 is roughly the size of the church. I think you're doing well if you can manage that. Realistically, um, you know, something like 12, 10 to 12 relationships um, that you keep in touch with people regularly. And I would say even smaller than that for deeper relationship, maybe um, four to eight. So let's look at group sizes. So just get a handle on these. Um, we are only really looking to disciple um, up to eight people, really. If Jesus took 12 um, and he was the son of God, we shouldn't really be trying to um, outstrip him. Um, how, having said that, by focusing on a few, by going deep uh, with a few, if they multiply what you've taught them, then you can go beyond Jesus. Um, he set it all in motion, of course, but you know he says great things will we do, and I think that, that we can do that through this process. So accountability groups, you can call them, or prayer groups, or um, uh, groups of two to three are perfect for deep sharing accountability and deep prayer. Three-thirds groups, I think this is the main type of group that I want to see at King Centre um, for discipling new believers. It's very simple. It's structured in three-thirds. You could have half an hour for each, like you do on a Sunday morning at Cafe Church. We look back um, on our week. Have you been faithful? Have you done what you said you were going to do? Did you um, obey Jesus, um, having read the word? Did, did you train somebody else? Did you share your faith with another? Um, then look up for half an hour. You're doing a discovery Bible study. Take simple stories uh, about Jesus. You could be looking at the seven signs, uh, I am statements of Jesus, or the, or the miracles of Jesus, uh, or the parables of Jesus, anything about Jesus. Um, at a simplistic level, you can discover for yourselves. And then based on that, looking forward, how we're going to apply that to our lives. Uh, huddle is similar, really, to those first two groups, except that it's for 
a leader, uh, someone who's already making disciples. So I have two or three huddles of groups of mature disciples who are um, leading others in faith. So uh, that could be a missional community that they're leading um, or uh, a nurture group um, or a, a traditional small group, if you like. Um, all of those groups, you're, you're actively making disciples so you're a leader, so you need some support. That's what a huddle is for. Um, and then finally, a missional community is usually bigger than four to eight because it's, it's multiple groups um, overseen by one leader. So essentially, King Centre is a bit like a large missional community that um, I oversee. Um, so I'm in a huddle. Um, uh, Nick Harding, who holds me from Liverpool. Um, and if any of you want to go and uh, lead other disciples, I suggest you, you get some support from other leader. And I will be, uh, at the end of this course, um, I'm basically saying you are free to go and make disciples, obviously. Um, if you want support in a huddle from that, uh, let me know and I'll okay finally how do we do it so disciples you could say are made one-on-one -on -one and two by two what do i mean by that well uh, it takes one to to raise one um, and um, we can use the the two to two to two principle so they come from two verses very helpful 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, um, in another version, it says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah. So it takes Christ to disciple us and it takes us to disciple someone else. So it's um, leading by example. And then in 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul's word to Timothy, who he... He leaves these two brilliant letters uh, where he's personally discipling one new leader, Timothy, who's left to, to look after the Christians in Ephesus, no mean task. Um, he says, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. So that's him uh, where, where Timothy is assisting Paul in trust to reliable people. So give it away again, who will also be qualified to teach others. So that's four levels there mentioned in scriptures. You've got Paul, who's discipled Timothy, and he's also discipled Timothy in the, uh, he's discipled the, pe the faithful people that uh, Timothy is now left with. Um, and he's gone from assisting Paul in doing that to now actually leading. And those faithful people are expected to teach others. So that's to the fourth generation. So I would have thought that Harry and Wendy um, are in the privileged position. Um, Addy, maybe he's listening um, to say, yeah, I've, I've taught someone over my life who's now taught others, who's taught others. So that's four generations of disciples um, that you've ever seen. That's a privileged position to be in. And you've heard me say this before, um, how do we do it? It's duck, duck, goose discipleship. So the ducks all line up behind mother duck. The mother duck is Jesus. You don't have to be fully mature like Jesus to get going. You can lead others. And the only thing you need to do to lead others is you need to be following Jesus and one step of those behind. And when we fly in formation as a community, um, if you're taking the lead, you're making it 20% um, easier for those to follow you. So just by taking a lead, you're helping others um, to make disciples. And we can help those in front by honking forwards um, and encouraging them.
Okay. So welcome back. This is the slide that I mentioned. So just to say, I'd, I'd mentioned model assist watch and leave as four processes, um, starting off with you doing it all and then stepping back bit by bit. But just to say that, you know, each step, um, if you have someone assisting you, they are learning as they apprenticed um, alongside you. And then that allows somebody else to model it and you then uh, get the person you were assisting to assist themselves and then you can just simply watch and eventually leave and you've still got a group of people who know what they're doing left behind you. Um, now I was challenged in February to say what our discipleship strategy was and Martin was in the room at the time and he couldn't articulate it. So that was a failure on my part. So I put this document together. He probably wishes I hadn't really. Um, but essentially the blue line along the middle is our, a, a, a sort of a, a strategy of sorts. It's a, a simplistic strategy and you can bolt on all sorts of programs or tools to that both personal and corporate. So um, I won't go into full detail, but look, you know, if we are trying to uh, gather um, many seekers towards uh, a place of belief, then things like Alpha or King's Kids or Food Bank or uh, God's Gangs, Craft and Cake Mornings, these are places where you might find seekers um, and helping them to move across to a place of belief uh, might involve uh, prayer, Bible, study, uh, commitment to, to being part of a community and things that we have to help people in that area, uh, sharing faith simply, which is, of course, we do, um, disciple making communities, which you can be a part of, huddles, which I'll say a bit more about in a second, chrysalis, which is starting again in September, which is uh, designed exactly to do uh, what this course has tried to do, but over a two year period of just one huddle a month, and then all sorts of things like in healing courses, um, which can lead to micro plants, more disciple making communities, more disciples and uh, other um, discipleship activities. And obviously, that can go on at a personal level as well as a corporate level. So that is our strategy for the church. So to finish, Jesus didn't make disciples this way. I, mean, I hope you recognize that, that. That's not what Israel looked like. So we shouldn't make our churches look like that or our small groups look like that. But you've got to think about how it looks like for you, whether it's over a coffee table, whether it's in your living room, or it's in an office. Um, just to share personally, you know, I've always felt that the ch church service on a Sunday um, or my relationship, God, fills me up to a point where I can flow out to those around me. And in terms of discipleship um, to those who are beyond uh, any formal discipleship arrangement and, you know, these questions I'm going to leave you with are to challenge you, um, perhaps over the summer, to ask God, ask your spouse, ask your community around you, where do you go from here? Um, so who, who and where is God sending you? Who are the people of peace that we've talked about that stick out in your mind? The people that you could spend more time with, invest more in the relationship with? And how are you going to start making disciples? Um, is it going to be sitting on a park bench? Is it going to be having a coffee? Is it going to be um, during those work uh, meetings um, where you have time to talk about Jesus, talk about how uh, his kingdom grows? Who are you going to be accountable to? So, you know, are you going to bring take someone with you or at least... Uh, let people know what you're doing and ask for their prayer support. And who's going to help you in that um, process? Who's going to 
train you up. So um, we've got uh, huddles, which will be starting in September, some new huddles, um, the likes of Kay and Ange and Bev have all been huddled, uh, and, and Harry and Marie, uh, Harry and Wendy rather, um, have all been trained in this stuff. Um, Adi and Nikkei as well. Um, Martin, uh, also on this call. Um, Tim and Joe. All of those people um, are um, equipped, if, if not willing, um, to sort of help you along. So um, I will be putting uh, some groups together in September, um, huddle groups. We typically meet once a month uh, just to talk through the situations that you're in, uh, pray with you, give any um, context-based teaching that's needed. And um, the challenge is we'll invest in others as they invest in others. So that's where we're 